morning, everyone, and welcome to our first Workplace Health Insights live event of the year. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. As you know, we've designed this series to discuss the healthcare challenges facing UK businesses. It's all part of our commitment to keep you informed on the latest trends we're seeing within Bupa and across the wider healthcare market. We want you as our intermediary partners to feel one step ahead when it comes to those latest insights so you can help your clients to navigate the health and wellbeing landscape. To support this promise, we also have the Bupa Academy for Health and Wellbeing, and Ian McMillan will be telling you more about this later on in the session. So if you want to kick off your year with some structured training that contributes to your CPD hours, please get in touch with your account manager. So on to today's topic. Well, today is a special event for our intermediary partners to share the health and wellbeing insights that are shaping the future workplace and healthcare market. The last two years have shown us just how unpredictable both the workplace and healthcare market can be. Both employers and healthcare providers have had to adapt and change rapidly to meet the needs of their people, sometimes finding themselves managing competing priorities. So today is all about looking ahead and our panel of Bupa experts will discuss their predictions for UK healthcare and how Bupa is transforming to meet the changing needs of our customers and our intermediary partners. We'll also share an update today on our service enhancements, proposition innovations, and some of our digital developments. So in terms of today's agenda, first up, we'll cover a quick COVID-19 update. You'll hear the latest clinical insights from Robin Clark, Medical Director for Bupa Global in UK, followed by an update on how Omicron is impacting service provision from James Sherwood, General Manager for Healthcare Management and Operations. Time will tell if this is the last time that we give this topic such dedicated attention. Let's keep our fingers crossed. We'll then turn our focus to the meat of today's session, healthcare in 2022 and beyond. And Robin will kick us off with the latest clinical horizon scanning, focusing on how predictive and preventative healthcare could shape future demand and provision. We'll then go back to James, who will share upcoming developments in Bupa's care proposition and care pathways and to take us through what Bupa's other priorities will be in 2022, you'll hear from our own Ian McMillan, Director of Distribution for Bupa UK Insurance. Ian will also update you on the latest structural changes that we've made within Bupa to continue to support our business partners. As ever, we'll have time for Q&A, so please make sure you send us your questions throughout the session, and we'll make sure we answer as many of them as we can. So there's loads to get through today. Let's get started. Robin, over to you. Thank you, Mark, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, great to be here today. So I'm going to walk you through some of the recent clinical developments regarding the coronavirus pandemic and what that's meant for the healthcare system. Now, if we think back to late last summer and early autumn, case numbers were moderate but stable, and the Delta variant had become the predominant strain. Now, that situation has changed quickly, particularly with the appearance of the Omicron variant, that was reported to the World Health, Health Organization on 24th November and detected in the UK only a few days later. And since this time, the Omicron variant has been the main driver of the record infection levels in the recent peak. And we've also seen that Omicron has outcompeted the Delta variant to become the dominant strain, with over 95% of cases now being Omicron. And Omicron cases are shown in the chart on, in, in purple, from which you can clearly see the cases spiking and that Omicron is the cause. Now, Omicron has some notable differences to the previous variants, and this influences its transmission and the effect of vaccines. So Omicron is heavily mutated compared to the other variants, especially the spike protein, which is the part of the virus that allows it to enter the human cells and is also the part targeted by vaccines. So these changes make it more transmissible and also more able to avoid the antibodies created by our immune systems. Now, Research data for vaccine effective against Omicron is, is still quite limited, uh, but indications are that vaccines are less effective against Omicron than other variants. And there is a higher risk of reinfection also with Omicron. However, having said that, vaccines do appear to have benefit against severe disease and hospitalization, and booster doses also increase the level of protection. So therefore, vaccines still have an important role to play in fighting the pandemic. Now, current data shows that the case numbers are beginning to decrease, though we should be aware that there could be some confounding factors in this data, such as 
the availability of lateral flow tests, which we know was a problem over the winter period, and also the changing guidance around who needs a confirmatory PCR test after a positive lateral flow test. We also now know that in London, the R number is now estimated to be near or just below one, with a number less than one indicating that the infection rate is dropping. So this is also a good sign. Looking at hospital admissions with COVID, this shows a similar trend in terms of stabilizing and possibly peaking. Now, typically there's a 10 day lag between catching coronavirus and being hospitalized. And this flattening of the curve of uh, hospitalizations has happened despite the case rate rising. So we can also see that the Omicron wave has behaved differently to previous waves. We should also acknowledge that not all regions in the UK have been equally affected. And what we can see in the data is that the Northeast and Yorkshire is slightly behind other regions with regards to the flattening of the curve for hospital admissions. Overall, however, the hospitalization figure are more reliable when we're assessing the healthcare impact than compared to looking just at the case rate. So that does give us reason to be optimistic. So overall, I think we can conclude that while COVID is still very much present, in the UK, we could be witnessing a turning point. And I think based on yesterday's government announcement, it seems they are also concluding the same. So thank you very much. And I'll hand now over to James. Thanks, Robin. Morning, everyone. Uh, so just to follow up on uh, Robin's um, uh, piece there, I just wanted to cover some of the mixed messages in the press uh, that we've been hearing about pressures on the NHS and the potential impact this has on private services. And I'm hoping that I can clarify uh, what's going on. So firstly, let's cover the 24 NHS trusts in England that declared critical incidents this month. Now, it's actually not unusual for trusts to declare critical incidents over the winter period. There are usually high numbers of people in hospital with flu or respiratory infections. So there are three categories of incidents, with a critical incident being the kind of medium severity category. Uh, and this essentially means that um, it's a localised issue and it results in the trust temporarily or permanently losing its ability to deliver critical services. In reality, there is little benefit to the trust in declaring a critical incident as it brings no additional support, resources or practical help. It does just bring a, a bit more oversight and governance for them. So um, in, light, in all likelihood, critical incidents are probably underdeclared. Now there's also no formal published list of all NHS trusts who have declared critical incidents or indeed whether they remain active. So um, it's, it's a bit of a, um, it's not a particularly useful indicator as to what's going on. But we do know there, that there are seven trusts that have made their status public um, and um, some of those are recognised uh, Booper hospitals and they're mainly clustered around Manchester. Um, but now those hospitals um, uh, over the last 10 months, um, they account for a very small amount of Booper activity. I think it's about a quarter of a percent of overall inpatient activity. Um, so, and there's um, other Booper sites nearby. So really that, that's not a material concern. Another piece of news was that the NH, it was that NHS England have entered into a new uh, COVID surge deal with independent hospitals outside of London through to the end of March. And this allows the NHS to use private capacity to treat patients if certain criteria are met. And you can see those on, on the screen at the moment. So um, the trust um, IP bed occupancy needs to be about 98%. COVID bed occupancy needs to exceed 35%. ITU um, uh, occupancy needs to exceed 85%. And there needs to be over 20% um, staff absences. All four criteria have to be met. And then the Department of Health has to approve the surge status uh, of the hospital. Uh, from uh, we understood that there are two or three hospitals that have applied for surge status already, and the Department of Health has not all three of them back. Now, again, data points for these four criteria also um, aren't all publicly available. Um, some of them are, um, but we think these are pretty difficult to satisfy. In particular, COVID bed occupancy 
is well below the 35% um, threshold at present. Um, and as Robbins has been pointing out, infection rates and hospital admissions seem to have stabilised. So hopefully, not famous last words, but we think that if this mechanism gets used, it will be on a very small scale for local hotspots. Um, so briefly, uh, before I finish, but the other aspect of the, the New Deal um, increases the tariff for certain procedures, uh, things like cancer surgery, and that's to encourage the independent hospitals to do more of this work to try and tackle the waiting lists uh, issue and some of the backlog in cancer um, that's built up. Uh, based on our discussions with the big groups, it doesn't sound like this is material enough to drive a big increase um, in that activity, and in any event, it would still be less profitable than private work. So the risk of that disrupting private care is also uh, very low. So in summary, uh, we hope this wave is already on the way out and don't expect any material disruption to private services from us. That's all from me. Uh, now back to you, Mark. Thanks, James. And uh, I've heard a couple of us now say famous last words. So let's keep our fingers crossed that we're that we're right. Maybe we should uh, run a poll today to see what everybody else thinks about whether we will be covering this topic again in the future or not. Let, let's see. Fingers crossed um, we, we won't be. So let's uh, let's park COVID-19 uh, and let's start to address the main topic for today, healthcare in 2022 and beyond. So I'm going to bring back Robin now, who's going to share some of our latest thinking around the clinical horizon scanning and what big trends we can expect to see in healthcare. So over to you again, Robin. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so focusing on predictive and preventative medicine. Now, medicine is sometimes categorised as the four P's, those being participatory, i.e. being actively involved in your healthcare, predictive, preventative and personalised. Personalised or precision is the other term that's sometimes used. So today I'm going to focus on the predictive and preventative elements mostly. Now, these aren't new concepts but these are areas that are advancing rapidly. And we, we can see that we're moving towards health and healthcare that's based on predicting needs before they arise, uh, where we're more able to prevent ill health. And when intervention is necessary, it will be more precise and focused on the individual's health needs. So overall, what we see is a digital first approach to healthcare, which is supported by data. And that in turn results in a more seamless, easy to access and a personalized customer journey with greater engagement with the customer. So just thinking a bit more then about uh, predictive healthcare. So, so that allows us to identify at-risk individuals and intervene earlier for better clinical outcomes. And we can do that across the entire healthcare journey. Now, some of you may already be familiar with the terms genomics and proteomics, uh, and I'll briefly give some examples of how they're enhancing our ability to predict individual risk. So, so genomics being the study of genetic sequences and proteomics being the study of the proteins in the body. So just, just moving on to genomics first. So the genome, that's the unique sequence of DNA. Uh, and there's over, it's over 3 billion letters long, and it's in nearly every cell in our body. Now, if we think back to 1990, so it took 13 years and a billion dollars to first sequence the genome. And if you fast forward to today, it now costs in the UK less than a thousand pounds and about 24 hours to do the same thing. So as a result, it's now efficient enough to use this in everyday clinical care and even in critical care scenarios. And I think, um, you know, we've been talking about COVID and it's also important to recognise the role of genome sequencing in the COVID pandemic. So it's been used to help identify the origins of it, uh, outbreaks and the spread of the different variants across the world. So just looking at the, the broad range of genetic tests that, that vary in scope. So at one extreme, you've got the single gene tests, and at the other extreme, you've got the whole genome sequencing, looking at the entire, entire DNA. And so we've got three examples here of genetic tests that are commonly used at different stages of a customer's health journey. So on the left, we've got the monogenic genetic tests. So that's testing for mutations in a single gene, looking typically uh, to diagnose disease or identify carrier status. So that's things like cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease. In the middle, we've got those predictive genetic tests. So that's assessing for hereditary risks. So for example, someone with a strong family history of breast cancer, they may be advised to have a BRCA test. And if they test positive for a BRCA gene mutation, that can then empower that customer to take preventative steps to reduce their risk further. So they may have risk reducing surgery or perhaps be invited for more regular screening. 
And then on the right hand side, we've got those genetic tests that predict the success of treatments and enable us to use targeted therapies. So the example we're showing here, the cell on the right hand side is producing excess amounts of the HER2 protein. Now, we know that HER2 positive tumors are less responsive to hormone therapy and some of the common chemotherapy agents. So therefore, by testing for HER2, uh, if it's positive, we can use Herceptin instead, which specifically targets those HER2 positive cells. So therefore, it's a, a better way of targeting the therapy at what the underlying problem is. Now let's have a quick look at some of the other emerging genetic tests. So here we're demonstrating polygenic risk scores. And what this is, it's, it's uh, based on an individual's genetic liability to a disease. So if we think of something like cardiovascular disease, there may be thousands of genes which we assess to understand their genetic liability. And it also considers lifestyle factors and environmental factors in the mix as well. And overall, then, it gives a relative risk score. So relative to the wider population. So are you less equal or more likely to develop cardiovascular disease? And this in turn allows that individual to proactively intervene and address those risk factors. Now, whilst this isn't yet used routinely, the area is moving at pace. So we do expect to see more of this happening. And then on the right hand side, we've got an example of pharmacogenetics. So this is predicting an individual's response to a, to a drug based on their genetics. So by doing that, we can therefore choose the best treatment by predicting the benefits or side effects that the individual may face. And that in turn can reduce healthcare spend by meaning that we can use the best treatment the first time. Uh, so that has benefits, for example, of reducing length of stays or, or readmissions or the cost of treating those side effects. I think that the next step here really is learning how and where we can implement uh, genetic and genomic testing for the greatest patient impact while simultaneously trying to decrease the burden on the healthcare system. And if we move topics now from genes to proteins or, or proteomics, so the concept here is that uh, protein levels change continuously within our body, and that's influenced by both the genetics and also environmental factors. And so these protein levels, we know that they change when the cells are diseased or stressed. So what it provides is a, is a real-time measurement of health by measuring these protein levels. And that in turn allows us to identify and monitor health conditions. So by being able to monitor progress and change in these proteins, that in turn can be really motivational in helping keep, keeping people healthy by giving them more regular updates on, on what their health is truly doing. So I think you can probably already see here that there's, a, there's quite a common theme, which really is that the more information that you have on an, on an individual and their health, really the more predictive that you can be. So I think we've now shown that predictive medicine naturally leads towards preventative healthcare. And we shouldn't underestimate the importance of primary prevention. And we all know about doing regular exercise, drinking in moderation and, and not smoking. But even this advice is becoming more specific to the individual as a result of genetic testing and these other personalized approaches. So just talking a bit more about primary prevention then, there's, there's lots of different approaches to primary prevention. And we're going to focus now on wearable devices. And in the last decade or so, we've seen quite a paradigm shift with the rise of digital health. And this has, has also been uh, sort of accelerated and the adoption has been accelerated due to the COVID pandemics. We've seen it, it rolled out far more readily. We've also seen how this wearable technology can really empower individuals to manage their health better. And the general, general notion around this is that by recording things like our activity levels and prompting users at the appropriate point, we can help them make improvements to their behavior and to their health. And I think you know, there, there's lots of examples here around, for example, smartwatches measuring activity levels or sleep. There's even smart toothbrushes that while you brush, it can perform an oral examination and you can share those details with your dentist um, through to care home residents where wearables may pick up early deterioration in their health and, and, and prevent hospital admissions. So what we're seeing overall here is a, is a clear shift from traditional healthcare models. And we're now intervening before symptoms arise rather than accessing healthcare only once you feel ill. And that leads us quite neatly into secondary prevention. Secondary prevention being an intervention to reduce the impact of the disease which has already occurred. 
And so some of the devices we just discussed are helping to cause that shift towards secondary prevention. So for example, the smartwatch example, we know now that some of them can identify low oxygen levels or abnormal heart rhythms. So by doing that, we're identifying disease, potentially identifying it earlier, and potentially before the individual has even had any symptoms. And looking forward, the prediction is that these smartwatches will soon be able to measure and monitor our blood pressure. And in fact, there's a study underway at present looking at how smartwatches can be used to monitor glucose levels and what the accuracy is. So you can see that there would be a significant benefit there to people with diabetes. On the right hand side, we've got another good example, uh, which is eye inspect. So this is using artificial intelligence technology to help identify eye disease and other systemic diseases. And so this is working by taking images taken during a standard eye test. It's comparing that against a database of hundreds of thousands of retinal images and it's identifying signs from your eye pictures um, of things like diabetes, glaucoma, or cardiovascular disease. So by, by uh, setting it up like this, it's neatly turning a regular eye checkup into a broader health screening opportunity. This next slide demonstrates how we can take this one step further and do individualized risk assessments rather than relying on the traditional population-based approaches of risk. So if we think about cardiovascular risk, then traditionally we would assess that by looking at things like age, your postcode, your family history, and whether you smoked. And overall, that would put you in a high, low, uh, high, high medium or, or low risk category. And if you were in a high risk category, you may be offered medication. But what we don't know for certain is whether you as an individual have or will have cardiovascular disease. Therefore, a proportion of people are going to be given med medication unnecessarily. On the flip side, what also happens is some people who do have disease are missed out because they're erroneously categorized as being low risk. So the example we're showing here is how CT calcium scoring can be used instead for assessing your risk of heart disease. And this is using a CT scan which can identify plaques in the arteries at a very early stage, meaning that intervention can then take place. And the benefits are it's non-invasive and it's relatively cheap. So this has got huge benefits in identifying arterial disease in people who would, uh, who would traditionally be missed because they were deemed low, low risk when actually they weren't. So by increased use of this test in, in targeted groups of people, we can personalize their risk assessment and prevent some of them from having heart attacks. So, now let's consider how healthcare is evolving when an individual is unwell or requires intervention. So we're now in the realms of, of uh, precision medicine. And whilst that's a relatively new term, the concept itself isn't. If you think about sort of blood transfusions or organ transplants, you know, we do those by, by matching you to a donor to reduce the risk of complications. And that in itself is, is a form of precision medicine. So we can broadly describe precision medicine as our ability to tailor interventions to an individual based on genetic or molecular profiling to optimize their health outcome. And we can do that either for subgroups of individuals or even down to the level of specific individuals. So to illustrate this, let's, uh, uh, let's use some examples. And we've got traditional medicine here, which uses the one size fits all approach. So treatments, in this traditional approach are developed for the average person with less consideration for the differences between people. And that can lead to worse outcomes and greater waste. So therefore it can increase healthcare costs. Precision medicine on the other hand, uh, does take into to account individual variability in things like genes, the environment and lifestyle. So clinicians can therefore predict more accurately which treatments for which disease will work in which people. So if we use an example of let's say someone diagnosed with cancer. So their tumor may be genetically profiled to help guide the treatment that's most likely to be effective. And then the dosage and timing of that treatment is further tailored based on, let's say, their kidney function or their ability to metabolize the drugs. So as shown, this approach can lead to increased benefit for our customers in the form of treatment outcomes and also potentially in cost. So in conclusion, I think you'll agree there's some significant shifts underway in how we identify health risks, how we perform screening uh, and in tailoring treatment. And there's some sizable benefits there for the individual as well as the wider healthcare system. So I'll uh, now hand back to Mark, but I'll be around for questions later. Thank you.
Thanks, Robin. Good, great job on taking a, a, what looks like an incredibly complex uh, topic and turning it into something that was certainly much simpler. I wouldn't say it was simple, uh, but you, you did a brilliant job there. I, I'm, I'm intrigued to know what smart socks are. I think I might buy him Millenson for Christmas, see if, see if it helps him out um, in the future. Um, right, so that's, uh, that's predictive and uh, predictive analytics and uh, precision medicine. Let's now hear from James again about how we're taking that on board and what our provision outlook is and what innovation we've got coming in our pathway. So James, back over to you. Thanks, Mark. Um, so I thought it'd be helpful to share an update on some recent and upcoming developments in our care proposition and care pathways. Um, you know, it's not yet as uh, 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 leading edge as some of the stuff that Robin has been talking out, which is kind of right at the frontier of development in medicine, but we've got some really impressive developments that I'm keen to talk about. Uh, so look, so let's start, start, start with Booper Touch. So Booper Touch is our digital platform for customers. Uh, it helps customers with some of the administrative aspects of having private medical insurance. Um, for example, providing customers with details about their policy, giving them access to their membership guide, uh, allowing them to see claim statements, um, but increasingly, it will um, allow people um, uh, access to um, uh, uh, care. And um, so, um, yeah, we're really excited about that. Um, we currently have about 400,000 customers enrolled in Booper Touch. Uh, the majority use the web version that we launched in uh, 2020. Uh, and in December 2021, we released a new app version. It includes some great new um, additional access to care features. So in essence, these new features allow customers to find out information about certain care conditions, uh, understand the most suitable care service for their need, and then connect directly into that service through secure calling directly within the app. Um, so that's a big step forward. It moves some of the uh, uh, stuff that we ask customers to do today, i.e. navigate their paper documents, to understand about services and then call telephone numbers. And we're starting to digitize that to make it much more accessible. Then later this year, we'll be building out more care journeys in the app um, and introducing features to better communicate pre-authorizations to customers and crucially what those pre-authorizations cover customers for. So I'm moving to our digital GP service, um, which has been provided in partnership with Babylon. So use of this has roughly doubled over the past year um, and roughly 12% of claiming customers now start their care journey uh, in the digital GP service, which shows just how important it is for ensuring appropriateness of referrals into secondary care and how useful it is for guiding customers to the most suitable service or provider. Over the past six months, we've introduced a number of new features into the digital GP service. Um, that allow a, a, a better assessment of a customer's needs um, and then allows um, us to match them with the most suitable clinician, be it a GP, a nurse, a physiotherapist or a pharmacist. And this is making the service more efficient, um, but it's also making quality of referrals into secondary care better. Uh, and you know, I think many of you know about our MSK pathways. So... You know, by, by, by getting these customers to a physio rather than a GP, um, it allows um, kind of fewer referrals into orthopedic surgeons, more, more conservative treatment recommendations. And what we've now got is 80% of customers with MSK conditions that are interacting with that service are now seeing a physio, which is a massive step forward. G the GPs are also now referring into our preferred pathways where appropriate. And that's resulting in more customers being guided into our remote skin pathway, our cardiac pathway, into MSK physicians and into our specialist centres. Um, so that's creating you know, a more integrated service for our customers, gives a better experience and leads to more efficient care. This year, we're working with Babylon to introduce uh, diagnostic testing uh, for a range of conditions to better inform the need for referrals and we're connecting the GPs with our preferred consultant network, which will help keep, keep um, secondary care costs down. Um, and finally, we're working on getting diagnosis and referral information directly from Babylon, so we can authorize care for the customer 
without the customer having to recontact us after having spoken to the GP, which will take a you know an annoying hassle point out of the journey for them. Um, move on to MSK pathways. Uh, last summer, we enhanced our MSK direct access service by recruiting a number of um, what are called advanced practice physiotherapists. This allows us to promote a remote assessment with a physio to customers that already have a GP referral to an orthopedic consultant. And that's because the advanced practice physios um, are, are, you know, it's all in the name. You know, they are um, uh, uh, of a high training and capability. Um, so this service has already been used by over 2,500 customers um, and is getting great feedback um, and is resulting in more appropriate onward referrals. This year, we're working on enabling digital appointment booking for this service from within Booper Touch, as well as better integrating any onward referrals from that service um, to a digital and to face-to-face -to -face -to -face physio service to remove some of the hassle for customers as well as improving coordination of care across those settings. Finally, I want to touch on mental health, where you know, we're doing a similar thing as an MSK. So we're working on integrating the remote triage element, the, the, the talking therapies um, that we can do remotely, and face-to-face -face treatment um, to improve customer experience, quality, uh, and affordability. And this, th these will um I'll explain will result in fewer administrative steps for the customer more support through case management and better coordination of care as we can share notes um, between the different providers um, uh, that need to work together to provide that holistic care experience uh, we launched the first phase of the remote therapy service um, for our mental health direct access so, uh, team in october and we'll be integrating the face-to-face -face element of that um, in the coming months. Uh, finally, um, on ca our cancer specialist centres. Um, so our cancer specialist centres, uh, just to remind you, they, they, they set a platinum standard of care and really stretch hospitals on quality experience and affordability. And last year, we added more breast specialist centres um, the network, uh, we now have um, 13 um, in all key, key geographies, um, and we saw a 31% increase in patients using um, that pathway. We also launched the bowel specialist centres last year. Uh, we now have three sites, and we're um, going to be steadily growing those. Um, you know, they offer a similar thing to the breast specialist centres, um, but you know, crucially, you know, it's a diagnosis within four days or less. And then later this year, we'll be launching um, the prostate uh, specialist centres, which I'm really excited about. So I'll, I'll pause there. Um, but to, to sum up, I think we've got some really big ambitions. Uh, we're making some great progress, making care more digitally accessible, and better integrating services, and as a result, guiding more strongly to our preferred providers. Uh, and this will drive better customer experience, improve quality of care, and help keep healthcare costs down. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions later on in the session and would love to get um, any reflections from you on how we're measuring up um, versus the competition. Back to you, Mark. Brilliant. Thanks, James. Um, really great to hear about all those innovations. And I think we at, at Booper are certainly getting really excited about uh, the Booper Touch app and, and how that's starting to develop into a really valuable um, asset for our customers as 2022 uh, progresses and, and into 2023 so really looking forward to seeing those um, those innovations become reality so for our final session today I'm going to hand over to Ian, Ian McMillan who will give us an insight into our 2022 priorities in UK insurance and and really try and pull out for you how we plan to support both our customers clients and you our intermediary partners so uh, Ian welcome to the session thanks Mark and good morning everybody um, yeah, just on the subject of smart socks, I, I actually treated myself to some new socks just before Christmas. So when you mentioned smart socks earlier, uh, I got a, a text from my good lady who's uh, watching us today uh, to say no more socks because I've been warned in no uncertain terms never to wear the ones that I bought outside of the house. So there you go. 
I look forward to the smart socks soon. Um, so just before I get started, it's, it's worth mentioning that as Mark alluded to right at the, 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 the start of this morning's session, we've made a few changes uh, from UK insurance in the last few months. And these have all got one goal in mind, which is putting a stronger focus on our business customers and intermediary partners. You may have seen some of the press coverage um, just before Christmas. And um, we have a new dedicated business for business and specialist products, which is PMI, dental insurance and cash plans. And that's headed up by Mark as the general manager. And as part of that, I was lucky enough to get a new role too. And now as distribution director for UK Insurance, I'll lead the team. Who, and and we, we have two main priorities. Firstly, focusing on our relationships with you, uh, B2B intermediary partners, and also take the lead on winning new business um, with your help and support. Uh, existing business will uh, sit under the dedicated teams who are focused on supporting uh, clients' health and well-being needs, well -being needs and Will Shaw uh, as Director of Corporate and Richard Norris as Director of SME and Specialist Business will lead those two teams and I'll, I'll cut across them uh, from a new business and intermediary relationship point of view. So in terms of uh, new propositions, I've, I've already said the word focus quite a lot there, but really that is our strategy. Um, B2B clients and intermediaries are absolutely a fundamental part of our business, and we think the market will be very active over the next few years as businesses continue to invest even more in health and well-being. Uh, and we're determined to demonstrate why we're better for business and the clear choice for you, our intermediary partners. And on that subject, I hope many of you have started to see our new message, Bupa, Better for Business. That's part of a refresh of our B2B proposition, which was rolled out to our corporate customers in autumn of last year, and it's launching to our SME customers just in the, uh, the next few weeks. And it's, it's quite clearly centred around a, a clear but bold ambition, and that is simply to be uh, those customers' trusted partner for health and well-being. And to sit alongside that, we're also developing a refreshed proposition for our B2B intermediary partners too, and another simple and bold ambition, which is to be your health and well-being partner of choice. Now, we'll build that proposition around the same three pillars that we've launched for corporate and SME, but also within that, recognising the expectations and the support you need from us. And that's things like prompt and accurate quotes, um, efficient and flexible digital servicing tools, and responsive account management. So you'll hear more about the, the, the intermediary proposition as we approach the spring, uh, and hopefully with it some, some warmer weather. But our role, quite simply, is to make sure that you feel one step ahead when it comes to the latest clinical information. So this year, uh, expect to see us sharing even more of our medical expertise through initiatives such as the Bupa Academy, which I'll touch on again later. If we have any consumer intermediaries joining us today, we've not forgotten about you. We're, we also have a new dedicated consumer business and uh, the guys over there are developing a new tailored proposition to support you. Uh, so some exciting developments coming there as well around product, digital platform and sales support. But moving on to our 2022 priorities and, and coming back specifically to our plans for business and specialist products, we're planning a really busy year of developments to deliver on our ambition about health and well-being partner of choice. And I'm just going to give you a summary of the key highlights which are organised around the new Better for Business proposition. So helping build healthier and happier organisations the new Bupa Academy for Health and Wellbeing is going to offer more trusted training and practical resources to you and your clients. Many of you will have attended at least one of these already. We we'll launched cancer and mental health modules last year. This year, we are aiming to launch modules focusing on MSK, women's health, and the role of behavioural insights to drive 
engagement with employees. We're also going to roll out some enhanced health and wellbeing MI, which will include a company health profile for our health assessment customers. And also we'll see the introduction of machine learning to review health assessment data and suggest the best health and wellbeing interventions for employees and members. Moving on to clinical expertise to keep your clients, people at their best. Well, James explained earlier, we are heavily investing in clinical services and pathways uh, to offer the best quality of care, as you would expect from UPA. Uh, and this year we'll see improvements to our cancer promise, including the new cancer specialist centres and also our mental health advantage that's been rated the market's most comprehensive by de facto. We also know that diversity and inclusion is still a priority issue for your clients. It's a priority issue for us as an employer, and it'll be a priority issue for you as an employer. So we're further enhancing our women's health services in partnership with our clinics business uh, to provide new services with extra support for periods, problems, uh, and that's in addition to our existing support for the menopause, including a dedicated menopause health line. On top of that, we're also developing new services to support neurodiversity in the workplace and an innovative whole of workplace solution uh, that will offer affordable health and well-being to everyone. We've also got some exciting new developments in our primary care services through our health clinics business um, and uh, particularly interesting an enhanced GP service, both in health centres and virtually. Uh, and alongside that, we've launched our remote health assessments, which allow us to be more flexible and take a hybrid well-being, well-being approach to meet the needs of customers who want to either visit us on site or from the comfort of their own home. Uh, and finally, uh, and importantly, I think for, for you on the call today, we're, we're investing to make healthcare easier to access and manage for you and your, client, uh, your clients. Big thing that we're doing is going to be making enhancements to our new business process and our, our quoting processes. And that will include a new pricing tool that will help us deliver the, the right quote faster. Um, alongside that, we'll be improving our client onboarding service to create a seamless journey for new clients and that will include refreshing all materials and support we offer as we welcome clients to BUPA. And, and I'll say it on your behalf, not before time, uh, and that will be given a uh, massive focus this year to improve your experience on the subject of quotes and onboarding. That will be heavily supported by BUPA Connect, uh, and, and we'll, we'll continue to see a, no a number of other enhancements which will better support you and your clients, both with managing and reporting for uh, existing schemes. As well as uh, Bupa Connect on the digital world, we're continuing to invest in the Bupa Touch Client platform. Uh, what we'll see this year is the integration of a new digital primary care experience, new online care navigator service, and improved self-service and self-management tools. Uh, and coming to our special, specialist products in the dental business, we'll be launching new proposition levels of cover and improvements to our BPD dental products. And we'll also be continuing with our BUPA dental care appointment guarantee. Uh, so ensuring that your customers get value and also access to dental treatment when they need it. Plus, we'll also be reducing our claims payment times. Uh, and showing members the remaining benefits on the Bupa Touch portal. And uh, lastly, for cash plan, but certainly not least, uh, we'll be launching a, a new cash plan platform, hopefully in uh, quarter two, uh, and that's going to allow members to see their benefits and remaining limits. We'll be able to claim much quicker through the online portal, and it'll give us improved digital capability to again, better serve those customers and, and let them access care. So it's going to be a very, very busy year, but uh, as I say, the year of focus on both business customers and particularly on intermediary partners. That was a sort of whistle stop tour, but um, if you'd like any more information on anything that I've mentioned here today, 
uh, reach out to your account manager or, or just drop me a line, ian.mcmillan at bupa.com. And that's it from me, Mark. Back to you. Great. Thank you, Ian. So uh, they're the main sessions for, for today. I think hopefully what you've seen is us continuing to look um, ahead into the future, some near-term stuff, but also some of the longer-term, very sophisticated um, developments that we're seeing, and we're always keeping one eye on that. And then what we're trying to get to is a really regular drumbeat um, for you, where we've got new things to say all the time. So that whether that's enhancements to existing services that we've got or completely new things that we're doing. The other thing that I think um, I hope you see through this year is, um, is a real focus on the business customer, whether that be you as our partner um, or your clients. And um, certainly I think we're already feeling the benefit of that in the Bupa um, world that I'm now running, where it definitely feels like you, the, the concept of you or your client in the room with us when we're making decisions with you, you and your clients very much front of mind, as well as continuing to try and make sure we do an amazing job um, for the employees and the members who experience our, our clinical services. So uh, you'll be the judge of that as we go through 2022, but we're really excited about the opportunity that that, that gives us. So hopefully you're getting a bit of a taster for that um, today. Um, so we're going to go into some questions. We've had a number coming through um, from the team. I think we're also going to set a, a quick poll live, uh, not about Ian's, um, Ian's socks or, or about whether we're going to talk about COVID anymore in the future. Uh, the question coming out to you is whether or not you expect demand for PMI to increase or decrease in 2022. We'll be really interested to get the market's views on those. Uh, but let's go to the, the first question. I'm going to go to you, um, Robin, if that's OK. So you, you've talked a lot, Robin, um, today uh, over a couple of slides, actually, about wearables. Um, and, you know, all of us have been wearing probably Apple watches or Fitbits and uh, Ian's been wearing his, his, his smart socks for a while now. But, you know, is this really something that people are just kind of counting their steps on or, or, or do we are we now starting to see you know, more widespread use of this this kind of kit in a, in a clinical setting? Yeah, do, do, is it here to stay? Yeah, no, good question. There's definitely some examples of these wearables being used in, in real life healthcare scenarios. Um, and yeah, there's a, a few that I can think of immediately uh, with regard to sort of MSK services. So uh, they're being used for, for instance, doing remote physiotherapy, where there's a, a sensor that you put on your joint uh, and it can measure how much you can move your, your hip or your knee sort of pre and post op orthopedic surgery, for example or measuring the range of movement as you have physiotherapy. So there's already programs that are using this, that, that, that are live and, uh, and in progress and collecting data to sort of prove, prove the worth of using it. So uh, I think once we get some good outcomes from things like that, I think we'll see far more adoption. Um, and there's also uh, a good example of a hospital out in Missouri called the Mercy Hospital, where they've got uh, a, a full suite of nurses uh, that look at intensive care information coming from patients located in remote units. So they're looking at this information 24-7. So actually, it's a higher level of uh, kind of medical attention that those individuals are getting compared to if your nurse was trying to look at your um, observations as well as run around and do lots of other jobs at the same time. So, yeah, it, it's definitely coming. It, it's definitely in, in practice. Um, we haven't seen widespread adoption yet, but undoubtedly that is coming. Great. Um, th thank you, Robin. And, and on a related note, I'm going to stay with you, if that's OK. I mean, we've, we've all seen over the last few years, all of us become amateur doctors as we sense something's wrong with ourselves and we go in and we Google it and we scare, scare ourselves. Um, but now, actually, with some of this data that we're getting, it goes beyond just what Google tells us. We've got, we've got actual data to prove maybe something. Do you, do you think doctors are starting to, to kind of be challenged and, and feel a bit concerned about how difficult this is going to get when patients turn up? kind of in believing they know more about themselves than the doctor's going to know? I mean, I think the reality is this is a trajectory that's been happening for, for many decades. You know, perhaps the technology has, has accelerated it now. Um, I, I think uh, a good example of the, the shift that's happening is within COVID itself. Um, the fact that the public were able to order diagnostic tests, perform them, them themselves, and report back on them and take an action as a result of that. I think that's a great example of the direction that we're going in. Um, so I think probably what we see in the, in the shorter term is where people have got smartwatches telling them that they've got a heart arrhythmia or that their blood pressure is high. I think there will be an increase in things like self-referral pathways in order to 
uh, address some of those findings. Um, longer term, I think it significantly increases the amount of kind of participative medicine and, and overall we know that that's beneficial. Um, so I, I, I think also it indicates that there's going to be a greater need for things like artificial intelligence to help sort the data. So to genuinely identify the patients that have a problem in their data versus those that don't. And the amount of data we're going to be getting from this is, is going to be huge. So we will need that to help drive the efficiencies. So I, I don't think the, the doctor's days are uh, over just yet. <laughs> not yet, no, not replaced by a robot just yet, uh, Robin, by the sounds of it. Um, Jack, James, you talked a little bit about some of the developments we're starting to, to see as we take things on to another level around digital GP and our relationship with, um, with Babylon. And someone's asked a question here about whether or not um, Babylon can send details of the consultation and the treatment to the members uh, GP but for that kind of continuity and their own GP knows what's going on when they've used that service? Yeah so um, at the moment the um, customer is given the option to do that um, and interesting not all customers choose to take take that up um, but that, that this this concept of um, and it's a bit of a clunky process and what, what, this, this, uh, but it touches on a, 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 an issue or an opportunity that I think is fundamental to improving integration of services, which is how we can more seamlessly transfer diagnosis and referral information from one provider to another, um, because that starts to better join up care and remove um some of the duplication that you see in um tests and things like that so um it's an area that um needs to get needs to be improved in the healthcare system and one that we're working on but yeah today um, customers are given the option to share information with their gp if they want to great um I know when it gets to this Q&A session, I always get a bit nervous when I see a really tough question come in because I'm always worried about asking it in case the likes of Robin and James refuse to ever come back to these uh, webinars for being put on the spot. But um, there's a question here about long COVID and I, I see the sort of fear in your eyes as we start to embrace this tricky topic. But I guess this is a moral dilemma. So as we look forward and people maybe continue to experience symptoms of, of long COVID, but they are unvaccinated, do, do we have any view about how our attitude might evolve um, from that perspective? Told you it was a good one. Rob, Robin or James, I, I guess, either of you. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to uh, to go first on that one. I mean, I, I think um, uh, th there's, there's a lot of implications to this. I, I think it would be extremely difficult for us in, in the current situation to kind of decline cover for someone as a result of the vaccination status. Uh, I mean, for a start, we don't collect information about vaccination status. There's lots of legitimate reasons why people might not have had a vaccine or why their vaccine failed, um, as well as the fact you can't always prove the link between someone having caught coronavirus and the symptoms that they're now experiencing. So I think there's lo lots of caveats there, um, as well as, I think, probably some significant legal and regulatory hurdles that would need to be addressed if we were going to penalise people on that basis. So um, I, I think for me, the answer is, is no. There you go. Uh, well, this is recorded, Robin. So uh, you know, if we change our minds in the future, I'm sure someone will, will remind us of that. But um, thank you for for answering that one. And then just just one other question. I think we'll try and um, cover t today before we close. Is um, again, sorry, Robin. You, you you're the celebrity today. Everyone wants a, a piece of what uh, you're thinking. But um, the, the predictive health measures that you talked about. You know, just it's great talking about it and saying it's coming and and so on but where are we really in terms of embracing those is this just a pipe dream that we'll start to embrace this or would you think this is coming sooner than we think and, and is Booper ready to, to, to take take on some of these um, the new techniques yeah so in, in some areas we're, we're definitely on the cusp of big things happening and in other areas we're already in the middle of it so um, I think to start with whatever we we offer needs to be backed and guided by evidence and yeah in some areas that evidence is still a little bit immature but it's definitely kind of moving at pace um i, I think a, a great example of where some of these predictive um elements are coming in is within the cancer treatment space so we're already funding uh genetic tests to understand people's risks if they've got strong family history and things like that 
um, and to help therefore guide their treatments to lead to better outcomes. So, you know, we've got lots of examples where, where we're already doing that. Um, and I think also, you know, for example, in our clinics business, so they're definitely looking into broadening, broadening the, the offering via health assessments and what we've done within screening. So, um, you know, so it's a very active space uh, and we are expecting this to change probably quite significantly over the coming years. So, um, yes, we're, we're definitely doing things at the moment and we're always keeping an eye out for, for the latest evidence and guidances. Brilliant. And uh, I, I guess these are topics that people can expect to hear more from us as the months progress. And, and also, I think we'd love to get into a dialogue with any of our intermediary partners. If you're seeing things or hearing things and you haven't heard us have a point of view on it, we'd love to know more about that because we probably have got a point of view or, or we may be able to help. So please do reach out to us. Um, there are a number of very specific questions that have come through, which we will endeavor uh, to answer, I think, offline. Uh, things like access to Bupa Touch, um, a couple of things about um, new features that we may be adding into Bupa Connect and some questions about things like claim suspension. So we've got your questions. If it was you that asked that, we will come back to you and, and, and provide an answer to, to those um, for sure. So. Um, I want to just wrap up today. Thank you um, so much for joining us uh, today. And thank you to our, our panel um, for another great update. We've got the results of the poll, which I think is great news, hopefully for all of us. 93% of you believe that the uh, PMI demand will increase in 2022. Um, so uh, that's good news, I guess, for all of us. And um, I hope what you're sensing from us here at Booper with this renewed focus around the creation of our new business and some of the new appointments we've talked to, plus this um, this kind of rollout of ongoing innovation and new features. But we're hoping we're really well placed to, to be great partners to you through 2022 and, and, and fingers crossed grow both of our businesses um, really effectively. So um, we hope you get off to a great start this year and we look forward to seeing you again in the next webinar in the coming weeks. So uh, have a great rest of the day and we'll see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>